reaction to me, and I had to take him to the clinic, the clinic the other day. They wrapped it up. I went over there to Holy Trinity Church and it was still bleeding, so I don't know if I'm going to have to take him to the emergency room or what, but he was, he's still having a rough time to stand on his feet. Yeah. Hmm. And I get on his case all the time, but I need to move his knees. He sits around all the time and doesn't exercise, and that's why he keeps falling. Yeah. Hmm. But I'd like for everybody to continue to pray for him because he needs it. Yeah. Well, let's, let's go ahead and pray for him now. Lord, we, we lift him to you. If you know the situation, Lord. You know what's what. We just pray that you would help him, have, help him with this specific thing, Lord, with this cut on his knee. Help it not to get worse. We pray, Lord, that you'd help him to be able to be a little more mobile and to be able to uh, feel a little more confident as he moves around. Help him not to fall, Lord. That's not a good thing. Just help him to know that you love him and that you're watching over him. Help him to uh, draw close to you. In your name we ask. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, we are um, in chapter 10 tonight of Proverbs. It's on 997 if you want to look in your pew Bible. How many of you have ever heard that life expectancy for people used to be a lot lower, a lot shorter than it is now. You heard that? I've talked about this with many people um, at school, for example, like during the Middle Ages or during Revolutionary War time in the United States. And uh, you can look and see statistics that like somebody, or not somebody, but life expectancy might be around 40. And we think, you know, really... It's just really so different than now. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with people that think that must mean there's just nobody around that's 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 or 100. But that's not the, that's not the case. It turns out that there still were all those people. Ben Franklin lived to be 80s, I think, late 80s. A lot of people did. The difference, the, the reason the life expectancy is so much shorter was because infant mortality was so high. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of babies, and a lot of those babies died, a lot more than now, and so the averages get pulled down. It wasn't that people that survived to adulthood were dying at a younger age. That, it, it's, it's just a math kind of thing. It's, a, it's a, not a trick, it's just a factor of, of the math. There's another math thing. Air travel, airplanes undeniably safer statistically than driving in a car. Yet how many people do you know? They're sitting at home, and if you say, hey, let's go out and get in the car and drive across town, they get the vapors. Oh, no, I'm just scared to death to ride in a car. <laughs> Nobody does that. I mean, I don't know anybody that does that. But to get on an airplane, we have to calm ourselves down, we have to take our medicine, we have to do all these things statistically so much safer. It's a math thing. It just is. It's just the way it is. Um, or how about this? Have you ever known someone who refuses to wear a seatbelt in their car? And the reason they refuse to wear a seatbelt is because Fred Jones was in a terrible accident one time, and if he'd have been wearing his seatbelt, it would have killed him. But he wasn't, and so he was thrown clear and he was like, <laughs> That might be true. But statistically speaking, seatbelts are the way to go. They, whether, whether we like them or not, the statistics bear out that seatbelts save lives. It, it is a massive thing. Is it true in every single case? No, it's not. It's not. Is it true always? No, it's not. Is that a good enough reason to ignore it? No, it's not. No, I'm going to keep wearing my seatbelt. Now, we finish the first section of Proverbs. The first nine chapters is one section. And now we're into to, uh, chapter 10. We start a new section. And it is organized and uh, written altogether differently than the first section. 
Uh, we'll try to see some organization and draw some conclusions about uh, the major themes. But a lot of this is the kind of thing that seems really pretty obvious of what it's getting at. And also, of the vast majority of this section contains these short statements that are, are not unlike that math thing I mentioned. They're things that are generally true. They, they're not promises akin to Jesus saying, you know, if I go away, I will come again. We don't think that's like probably true. No, we, we, that is true. That is what's going to happen. We, I mean, the, the, the prophecies of Jesus, we take them to the bank. The things that Daniel said, we believe them. I mean, there are some things in the scriptures that are like that. But there are Proverbs that are not like that. Not entirely. They're, they they show us, these Proverbs show us the way the world generally works and, and wisdom is shown as a realization of that and a, a learning to function within that it usually works this way, way. I see, I can look at the Proverbs and I can see that these things generally happen like this. It would be wise of me to get in line with the way things generally happen. But they're not promises. They're not promises, and we need to remember that. All right, so section two of the book is uh, chapters 10 through 15. And it's really a collection of these sentence proverbs. And the overwhelming characteristic of this, of this section is contrast. The way it's laid out, it's all about contrast. We might wonder why or how, like commentators or people that like Bible scholars, how they see these divisions in the book. Like, how do they know it's from 10 to 15? Well, the first nine chapters, and, and you'll be able to see this a lot more clearly after we look at this chapter, this chapter is way different than any of the first nine. The first nine, you could see week by week, they kind of were similar in the way they were written, the way they work. This is going to be way different. So this one's an easy one. But like, how do they know it ends in 15? Well, you can look at your Bible, you won't really see that. But here's a couple of reasons. One is a lot more obvious than the other. Uh, and that's the first part I just mentioned, that the first nine chapters super kind of go as a unit. They're really different in the way this one is. They didn't have that line after line after line of just Proverbs, and this does. That's obvious. Here's a less obvious one. I would never have noticed this myself if I hadn't read it in the commentary. In this second section, 10 through 15, there are 375 Proverbs. 375. The Hebrew language has ties to numerology, number stuff, okay? And in the Hebrew language, each letter has a numerical equivalent. The letters in Solomon's name, what do you suppose they add up to? 375. 375. <laughs> and so they, the, 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 the commentators say then that that's too much to be a coincidence, and so the editor, the person that collected all these proverbs, because we've already said one person didn't just write all this book, they, they did that on purpose, to kind of connect it to Solomon and give it some unity. It, I, I kind of like the idea that the people that are writing the Bible are, are trying to get God's truth, yes, but they're also trying to be like creative, even artistic in doing it. They're, they're writers. They're, they're trying to come up with literature. Secondary to God's purposes, yes, but still there. That's okay. So that's really cool, I think. Um, now, as we look into chapter 10, it really goes into the, you might say in a way, the first 13 verses of chapter 11. There's a whole bunch 
of these contrasts that are righteous and wicked. Contrast between righteous and wicked. The, and, and this kind of shows us the importance of having those like right at the beginning of the section kind of shows the importance of like ethical concerns. Like it might be good if you were careful with money, but it's more important if you got the difference between righteousness and wickedness down. So it's like a prioritizing kind of thing. All right. Um, there is a general outline to chapter 10. Though I kind of have a feeling that the outlines in the rest of the book might be a lot less clear than the ones we've been looking at the first nine chapters. So in the first five verses of chapter 10, verse one through five, that's the prologue. And it's uh, <clears throat> wise and foolish sons and the watching God. Wise and foolish sons and the watching God. Yahweh, the Lord, God. Okay, verses 6 through 21 is the middle section, and that is blessing and the life of the community. And then the last, uh, last uh, 11 verses, 22 through 32, the blessings of Yahweh and the ends of the righteous and wicked. The blessing of Yahweh and the ends of the righteous and wicked. How they end up. Now, I don't want to insult anyone or tell you something that you all clearly know, but just so that we all know, Yahweh, which we usually write Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E in, in Hebrew, wouldn't have the vowels, so sometimes we see just Y-H-W-H. -H. That is the name that God told Moses when Moses said, well, when I go down there to Egypt and you tell me to go, what, who, what, what am I going to say your name is? And he said, I am that I am. That's Yahweh. That's, what, that's the, the translation of it. Okay, and... They don't do vowels. They don't put the vowels in it in the Hebrew because it's too sacred. They don't say it out loud. In your Old Testament, uh, if you see the word Lord and it's all capitals, that's Yahweh. That's how they've translated it. Okay. Okay, so um, when we look at the first five verses, of chapter 10, the Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord will not allow the righteous soul to famish, but he casts away the desire of the wicked. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a wise son, he who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. <clears throat> so at first glance, it might seem like this is a lot like those other ones that we've done already. It seems familiar. You had a father speaking to a son. And yeah, there's an air of that. But it's different. <clears throat> at least in one regard, it's not like a dialogue. In the first part was. You had a lot of dialogue. Listen, my son, kinds of things. Doesn't have that. Um, it, and um, it is different because of what's coming, too. I mean, I, I know that I was the one who said we'd study Proverbs. Like, nobody asked me, could we do this? I was the one that started out on this way, or I felt led to do this. This is the section I was actually concerned about. <laughs> You might wonder why. They're like, well, I read this. It's so easy to understand, Pastor. Why do you be concerned about this? Because it's so easy to understand. If it's like super obvious and you read it and you're like, okay, now what? I mean, it, it, it might take me three minutes to read the chapter to you, but then like I wouldn't be doing my job if we got out at 620. So like there, there has to be more to it than that. That being so easy is what makes it hard to teach or preach on. It's almost like you read the passage and you're like, okay, well, I, I, amen, well, let's go. 
Uh, but we'll see if we, we'll dig into it a little more and see if there's more that we can learn. Um, so I want to repeat something I've said before that I've mentioned a few times now in the weeks gone by. It might say son as the one that the thoughts are directed to, but there's something to learn for daughters as well. And everybody is one of those two things. Not everybody's a father or mother, but everybody's a son or a daughter. And it's not specific in this case. So we apply this to us. Also, I shouldn't read it distantly as though, well, I mean, yes, I am a son. And yes, my father's still alive. But I mean, like, I don't, I'm not, I don't operate as a son. So I've like aged out of this. I kind of got this stuff. I'm in a different phase in my life. No, I shouldn't read that like that as though there's nothing there for me. I really don't think there is any passage in, in Scripture, any passage of the Bible where I can afford to quickly read it and pass on and think, well, I got that. Yeah, I got this. No, I, I mean, maybe you do, but I don't think I can do that. I, I think that I have to at least ponder a little bit and say, maybe there's an area here where I could probably do better. Um, though I said the outlines may be more of a thing in the first section, there is, in these first five verses, they are set up in one of those chiastic patterns, the kind of the X thing. So like verse 1 and verse 5 are similar. Verse 2 and 4 are similar. Verse 3 is right in the middle and kind of ties it together. So uh, we have these contrasts of wise and foolish sons ill-gotten gains versus righteousness, along with poverty brought on by laziness, um, or, yeah, and then uh, wealth earned through hard work. Then in the center statement, it's God satisfying the, the righteous but thwarts the cravings of the wicked. So it's like a little section within that all ties itself to each other. Um, I think it's also important for us to remember that Proverbs is one of the wisdom books of the Bible along with uh, Ecclesiastes and Job. There are elements of other books that are also wisdom writings. For example, some of the Psalms. But as far as just books, it, the wisdom books are Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Job. And <clears throat> they are all included in the, the canon of Scripture. They're all equally God's word, but they don't really present the same picture, not in the same way. Proverbs is, you might say, really optimistic. Proverbs gives us like statements that some of them, we might find ourselves thinking, I hope that's true always. But then we have to be serious and say, but it's a proverb. And it, it isn't, not, I mean, there, that's not the nature of it. Okay, so uh, you might remember way back few, many weeks ago, I mentioned this professor that used to tell his students, barking dogs never bite, usually. <laughs> that's the way these proverbs work. See, God created the world and Though it has been tainted through sin, there is still an order um, to the way things tend to work. That's just true. It is, I mean, that is true. That being said, though, we have to remember that things don't always work as we wish because it is a world tainted by sin. The classic case that one we all wish was true all the time, every time. Train up a child the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. That is one of those things that is a generally true statement of the way things work. It is generally true. But I've read the rest of the Bible, and I understand that people have a free will. Even the children of Christians. They have a free will. So 
the writer of the proverb, train up a child in the way he should go, I think would be horrified at the number of Christian parents that have beaten themselves up and let the devil beat them up with that verse of scripture. Clearly, you didn't do something right. Clearly, you didn't, oh, you didn't raise them the way they should go. If they did, they wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> Don't do that. Amen. That's not the way. I mean, it, it's a generally true statement. And just like the next time I read a newspaper story about the person that was in the terrible four car crash and the only survivor was thrown from the thing because they weren't wearing their seatbelt. I'm not going to start take, you know, I'm not going to quit wearing my seatbelt because I saw that. I'm not, I, I still think that raising kids according to the dictates of scripture and in the fear and admonition of the Lord is the way to do it. It is the way, like, no matter what else happens, it is its own reward to do that. So um, the Proverbs are these generally true things. It's, it's that math thing. Just because you can point to a case that seems not to have worked out that way, that would be foolish to use that as a reason why um, to... Uh, start going the other way. Now, I'm still going to wear seatbelts. I'm not going to start smoking. Even if I see the person in the paper that just turned 102 and granny, what's your secret, granny? Well, she smoked four packs of cigarettes a day for the last 75 years. Okay. Okay. I mean, sure. I, I don't doubt, I don't doubt the veracity of the story. I don't think that's what's kept her alive. But even if it did, it would be foolish of me to think, you know, I need to add to my life too. So I, I need a nicotine habit, I guess. No, that's dumb. You shouldn't do that. So in contrast to this like really optimistic view of Proverbs, we have in the, in the canon of scripture, one of the wisdom books, we have Job. Job's a wisdom book too. Job isn't like that at all. Job is, is all about how things don't really work out a lot of the times the way they should. Job's a guy, he's doing everything he's supposed to be doing. And then it all goes away. And he's left sitting on the ash heap with a broken piece of pottery scraping his boils. And his friends come and say, Job, we actually read the book of Proverbs. And if you had done this, then this would have happened. And if you hadn't done that, then this would never have happened. And they use those sorts of Proverbs as a way of like beating him and saying, see, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. But Job's the other end of the spectrum. The, the book of Job is the other end of the spectrum. So <clears throat> we have to See, and Ecclesiastes is a little bit like Job too. So when we want to look at a realistic view of the world, and I am not saying Proverbs is not realistic. I'm just saying it's a different way of looking at things. Okay? When we want to see things correctly and ac accurately, I think a telescopic view of Scripture might be more helpful than a microscopic view view of scripture where I take one verse and I'm like pinning everything on this one verse. If I pin everything on this one verse, then I don't have to worry about all the things that don't really support what I make of this one verse. That's Amen. not a way to read. That's not a way to read scripture. That's one reason we come to church so that we can kind of get the fuller picture because left to our own, we come up with some questionable <laughs> interpretations of things. We do it with other things too. Things happen, you know, and people, your friend might tell you, well, I've been thinking about this a lot and I think this is what's going on. And, and you think to yourself, no, that no. You think that because you're in a world of hurt now, but that's not the way things are. We need other people to help us and we need scripture to help us and we need church to kind of draw us out of that. Okay, so 
Back to chapter 10 here. Verse 1, we see this statement about a wise son. I feel like we live in a world that wants to see everything like as an isolated case and wants no connection between my actions and anybody else. What I do has got nothing to do with you kind of a thing. I think a lot of kids tend to think that way. They think their parents are silly or worse for placing too much personal emphasis on the son or the daughter's behavior as though it matters to them as the parent. This is my life. It's got nothing to do with you kind of thing. Well, the uh, writer of the Proverbs didn't feel that way. In fact, in many Middle Eastern societies, and I think it's this way still in many Middle Eastern societies, I find it really fascinating. The father is known as the father of the oldest son. So following that way of thinking, I would be referred to as Russell Abu Isaac. Well, now that puts a little different slant on things. If I'm going to be known, if every time somebody addresses me, they're bringing up my oldest son, well, I kind of have a vested interest in him not being a fool. I mean, it kind of matters to me. That's why it says the wise son brings, or a foolish son brings shame. That's what he's talking about. It brings real shame. And uh, so th this chapter, another little kind of tying together, beginning and ending. At the beginning, we got this thing about the wise son. Later, almost at the end, we have a thing about a wise messenger, or a, excuse me, a lazy messenger. That'll be in verse 26. We'll come back to that. Uh, since this chapter is the beginning of this second major section of the book, it takes themes from the first section, and it places them like in a new setting. Now it's really less oriented toward parents and more toward community at large. So if we look over the whole chapter, we see these series of contrasts that are the major themes. And there's five of them. The first one is laziness versus diligence. Laziness versus diligence. The second one is shame versus honor. Shame versus honor. The third is poverty versus wealth. Poverty versus wealth. Fourth one is wise speech versus destructive speech. Wise speech versus destructive speech. And the last one, righteousness versus wickedness. And it's always showing these contrasts. Okay, so <clears throat> now... What was the last one? I'm sorry. No problem. Righteousness versus wickedness. Yeah. 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 I mean, feel free to ask if I if I end up going too fast. All right. So now we're into this section of like, bam, 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 one line at a time. So I'm just going to kind of read a line and then a thought about it. Verse 6, blessings are on the head of the righteous, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Have you ever noticed that some people are just surrounded by drama constantly? In most cases, the lives of the committed followers of Christ would not make for good TV. Because there's not nearly enough drama going on about it. If, I mean, I'm probably not the only person that has turned the channel... I don't watch TV hardly ever, not air broadcast TV. Turn the channel, though, and sometimes and see, like, Dr. Phil, Maury, any of those. And you're like, where did they find these people? But then, like, I lived long enough, and I realized, oh, well, they weren't that hard to find. Some of them live around here. Uh, for, uh, seven, the memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. You ever think about, like, what people might say or think about you when you're gone? I personally want to live in such a way that when people do remember me, it evokes happy memories and good feelings. Those who care nothing for God, the wicked, they're memorable for different reasons. And I think that what part of what might be insinuated by this verse here is that we just like try to forget them. We put them out of our minds. Having been a teacher, I've dealt with groups of people for 38 years in a row. And the ones in a in a sad sort of way, 
given year, the one that caused me to pay attention to them the most is usually the one I try to forget as soon as the... I had one girl, I rarely think of her, and I never think of her pleasantly. <laughs> had her for three years, and I still remember savoring the moment, the last moment she was in my classroom, and I got up to see her walk out the door for the last time, watch the door shut. And <laughs> I made it. Now, I don't want to be that person. I think sometimes, like it says, the name of the wicked will rot. We don't want to be that. The wise in heart will receive commands, but a prating fool will fall. We've talked about this. People that are wise know they don't know enough. He who walks with integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will become known. Uh, living with lies and secrets is tiresome. Always being afraid you're going to be found out. See, living with integrity is not to have that daily fear of being found out. I still personally, I, 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 I don't want people to know all my deepest secrets. Mostly just I'd be embarrassed. Not because I'd be ashamed in the biblical sense. But like some, of, some people don't want you to know because there's real shame involved. Uh, 10, he who winks with the eye causes trouble, but a prating fool will fall. The mouth of the righteous is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Uh, <clears throat> the winking with the eye, I, it meant something to them, you know, some sort of like gesture that means, you know, they mean something bad by it. The other part, you know, I mean, some people live by, or some people bring violence by running their mouth. They don't know when to shut up. <laughs> they gotta say one more thing. They gotta have the last word, and then it brings problems. Uh, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. I, I think this one's a really Jesus-flavored proverb. When when we return ill feeling for ill feeling, let alone hatred for hatred, that keeps stuff stirred up. Strife is perpetuated. If we want to calm things down, we learn to respond in love. Wisdom is found on the lips of him who has understanding, but a rod is for the back of him who's devoid of understanding. Okay, I'm getting nervous. I'm not going to finish in time, but I'm going to tell you this story. I used to tell my kids this, my students, this story at, a, at an appropriate time. I would say when I was a kid, my dad had hunting dogs, beagles. They weren't pets. I couldn't play with them, but I did get to take care of them. That was one of those things. But we had these, we usually had four of them at once. These beagles were highly trained by my dad. That's a whole different story. But they had this pen out in the back corner of the uh, yard. And beagles are quiet until they're not. And then they're really not. And when one of them gets going, they all get going. And if they get a little whiff of a rabbit, that's when they get going. <laughs> It just goes on. So I, my dad would say to me, we'd be sitting and watch TV or something, my dad would say, go out and get them dogs quiet. So here's why I tell my kids. I would go to the back door of the garage and open the door and step out and say, hey! And if that did it, I shut the door and went and sat down. But sometimes that wasn't enough. And so I'd go a little closer, about halfway, and I'd yell louder. If that did it, I turned around and came back. If that didn't do it, then I'd go up and like kick the cage, kick the pin, and really get on them. If that did it, I turned around and came back. If that didn't do it, I went in the cage after finding a stick. My kids were all like, you can do it. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. They didn't need the stick. It didn't have to be that way. Where's the night verse here? Wisdom is found on the lips of him who has understanding, but a rod is for the back of him who is devoid of understanding. <laughs> See, some people are like that. You can't just tell them. You can't just, they're, they're not go-along people. So they get that. Wise people store up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Again, wise people are people who are learners. They know that they don't know enough. Um, <clears throat> 
The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. The labor of the righteous leads to life. The wages of the wicked to sin. Uh, we should keep in mind a couple things as we read about wealth or poverty in Proverbs, probably scripture as well. Uh, I think that we have very different ideas of what wealth is, and we have very different ideas of what poverty is as pertains to scripture. So we have to, to maybe better understand, try to imagine what they're saying about it. We, for an American, wealth is, no American is wealthy. Well, other Americans are. Very few Americans say I'm wealthy because it's, it's when I have more that I'm going to be wealthy. But we, if we compared ourselves to those people in Haiti, well, I mean, we're all just stinking rich. Yeah. So we have to be careful with that. He who keeps instruction is in the way of life, but he who refuses correction goes astray. Whoever hides hatred has lying lips. Whoever spreads slander is a fool. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. I used to tell my own children, <laughs> and I try to tell myself, if you keep talking long enough, you're eventually going to say something dumb. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of wisdom. A lot of the Proverbs on, on speech are gathered in clusters like this. There's, these four lines are together. Uh, the last section, going here from 22 on, is going to seem very much like what we've just been reading, but the thing that marks it different is it starts talking about the Lord, whereas none of that middle section did. Um, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. I think he, that rich here does not necessarily refer to material wealth, at least not only that. God's blessings might come and go amid sorrow, but God doesn't bring sorrow. He might allow it, but he doesn't bring it. Uh, to do evil is like a sport to a fool, but a man of understanding has wisdom. To do evil is like a sport to a fool. Some people... They just want to see what trouble they can get into. And you think, why would you do that? Look at the newspaper. I, I challenge you, read the newspaper, the court thing and the police beat part. Mm -hmm. If you read it for a year and wrote down the names, there would be some names you would start to see over yeah. and over yeah. and over and over. I saw one this week, and I remember when that kid was in trouble at the school about every day. <laughs> So if I had said, I don't think I had him in class, thankfully, if I'd had him in class and if I'd have said, okay, you'd like one of the FFA, the future felons of America, I would have been right because he never learned it. And every day he just likes to look out for trouble. Um, I never said that to a kid, by the way. Uh, the fear of the wicked will come upon him and the desire of the righteous will be granted. When the whirlwind passes by, the wicked is no more, but the righteous has an everlasting foundation, kind of like the wise man built his house upon the rock. As vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the lazy man to those who send him. This is that lazy messenger. This man is being sent by people. It echoes the wise son in the first verse in a contrasting way. The lazy man is sometimes referred to as the sluggard and really never seen in a good light, but it's he's also not seen as just the outright wicked person. Uh, we'll talk more about the sluggard later in Proverbs. It, here, it's just regarding this messenger. And, and think about in a pre-electronic age, how messages are delivered. I was telling Rachel, I've been reading this book about Lord Nelson and the Battle of Trafalgar, which happened in the early 1800s. He's traveling the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, in a sailing ship. And he's looking for other sailing ships and he's getting messages. And you're like, wait a minute, how? You have to be able to trust the messenger to be on top of things. Uh, the lazy man is like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes to the ones that send him. If the guy is supposed to be delivering the message, it's, it's as timely as it's gonna be 
being hand delivered like that. But if that guy's messing around, now it, it might be too late. And so that's why that's a thing. Uh, the fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. We mentioned this concept before, like adding years to your life and adding life to your years. The hope of the righteous will be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. And I can't help but see this in light of the gospel, because what's the hope of the righteous? It's eternity with Jesus, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that'll be gladness for sure. What's the expectation of the wicked? Well, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get to the judgment. I'm just gonna have to talk with God. <laughs> Are you? They're, they're, they're gonna get. They're just gonna go to hell. But it's all gonna be okay because everybody they know is gonna be there. It'll be like one big party. Mm -hmm. Or they think they don't have to worry about it at all because there isn't anything after death. So with that in mind, the hope of the righteous will be gladness. The expectation of the wicked will perish. None of those things they think is going to be the way it was. The way of the Lord is strength for the upright, but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not inhabit the earth. The mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut out. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked what is perverse. I think these last four verses are a real encouragement to close out this chapter. I realize that chapter headings are newer than the book of Proverbs. In other words, they didn't put those in there. Verse numbers, chapter numbers, that wasn't there. Um, but we have them, and here they are. I think a clear path is shown. We might say that after the last couple of Sundays, what we've been talking about on Sunday morning, what we see here in these last four verses is a contrast between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. Can we expect a trouble-free life? Well, maybe not. But in a biblical way of speaking, it's like that math thing again. I like the odds. I'm going to go with the, the way of the Lord here, even if it isn't foolproof for carefree holiday kind of existence every day. It's still, the odds are with me. Even if I'm just worrying about odds, the odds are with me because it's that math thing. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for uh, your word to us tonight. Thank you for the wisdom that's been uh, written down here and, and given to us forever to, to have, Lord. Your word is good to us. Help us to understand the Proverbs and, and what they mean and how we can live by them. Help us to know the difference between a proverb and a promise. And help us not to let that bother us. To know that you are good and you are you have good for us. And you mean good to us. Thank you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming tonight.